We are finishing up our talk series called Mind Wars, and it's been a good series. I thought it would be a good series to start the beginning of the year with because let's face it, life's battles are mostly all won or lost between our ears, right? Yeah, what, what comes into our minds tends to come out in our life. And what we've learned over the, the course of these last three weeks is that the more we think a thought, the easier it is to think that thought again. And so what we're doing is we're going to war and learning how we can win the war in our minds. And our whole theme verse is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And again, Dylan already mentioned it, but if you want to follow along on our app, you can see all of the notes. But sometimes it's just good to write them all down anyway, all right? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if you want to change your life, You have to learn how to change your mind. And this is what this scripture is saying. Another translation, instead of using the word renewing, it uses the word renovating. And there's some of us in this room, our minds are in desperate need of a renovation. Come on, somebody. No elbowing allowed right now. But but let let me just recap kind of where we've been, because we've covered some major, I believe, some major opportunities for that renovation to take place. We renew our minds by the first week we learned by redirecting our thoughts. And that's when we kicked off our 21 days of prayer. And then we renew our minds by the reshaping of our thoughts. Pastor Darren Laws talked about that. And then last week we talked about we renew our minds by the retooling of our thoughts and and getting God's toolbox out and going into the word and worship through music. And today we're talking about renewing our minds by the reframing of our thoughts, the reframing of our thoughts. Now, I I believe out of all of these four talks that we're getting in this series, this one is probably going to be the most important one for several of you that are listening. And, And the reason why is that a lot of us Our our minds have a brokenness to them. And, you know, scientists and psychologists call it cognitive bias. How many have heard of this, uh, this expression before? That all of our minds run with a cognitive bias. Let me give you the psychology definition just so that you can kind of understand what we're talking about. It means a systematic thought process caused by the tendency of the human brain to simplify information processing through a filter of personal experience and preferences. So we have to understand that when we think, we all have a bias on how we think. And those biases are determined by mainly two things, personal experiences and also preferences. This is why, you know, when you walk up, let's say two people walk up to a homeless dog in the street, the two people are more than likely going to respond differently to the homeless dog. One of the, per, the, one of the people may walk up to the dog and get really like spooked out, like, oh, don't get too close. The dog might have rabies. Did it get all of its shots? And dogs are mean. So you don't know how to approach a dog. Whereas the other person just goes right out, oh, doggy, oh. I just want to take you home. Who left you outside? Who left you out here? I know some of you. I see your posts on Instagram with your dog. So so here here we have two different responses. Well, the facts are, are, are the same in both that situation, but the people's response are different because of the bias. Some of you, it's because of a traumatic event possibly by a man when you were growing up. Some of you ladies, you've struggled with your relationships with men simply because there is a bias that is rooted in your thinking based upon a traumatic event that a man caused you when you were little. That creates these biases that we have. And these biases are real. These filters that we have, they they can determine so much of the outcome of how we handle 
our lives. For example, some of us, the filter, the bias that, that we're running with, it could be so next level that if you're preparing to have a conversation with somebody, and I'm sure this hasn't happened to anybody here, you're preparing to have a conversation with somebody and, and you're a classic overthinker, and before you get into the, maybe it's a conversation with a coworker or a boss, maybe it's with a family member, maybe it's with your spouse, and, and you're anticipating the conversation and you're thinking about this conversation so much, remember, you're running it through this filter. How many have ever stepped into a conversation with somebody and you've thought about it so much that you're already upset and angry and frustrated at this person and they haven't even said anything to you yet? Because in your mind, you've already had these conversations that have not went well because you have run them through this filter process. And so you, you finally get to them and, and you sit down to talk with them and you are mad dogging them. You are upset. You're raising your voice. And they're like, what? hey, whoa, whoa, what's happened here? Like, you know. No, I don't know. It's, it's because what you said. I didn't say anything. But in your mind, you've already run this conversation through a filter, creating an outcome before the outcome even was real. Say with me, filters matter. They, they matter. And, and the filter will always determine the feel of a situation. Let me give you an example. Uh, Tara and I were hiking the other day, and we took a selfie out there. You know, I don't know where we were hiking. Um, I think the botanical gardens. And so we're just enjoying a hike. Well, my soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Bella, got a hold of this picture, and she added some filters to it. And this is what she came up with. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in this picture. Uh, the, the two Eiffel Towers. Uh, I don't know where we are. I don't know what's up with Tara's haircut. Or the dress she's wearing. I'm wearing a hat. I think I'm drinking a beer. I don't know. A tuxedo vest on. But the filter determines the feel. And, and so as you filter a picture, it, it changes the feel of a picture. And when we filter our thoughts, it changes the feel of the relationship or the outcome of whatever the situation is that is going on. See, the facts can be all the same, but the way we process the filter creates a whole different feeling. Let me give you a couple examples. Let's say two people that work at the same place both get job performance reviews. So they walk into their boss, and they get the same review, they get the same job performance you know, feedback, and you know, the boss is telling them, hey, this is where you could get better, and this is where you can improve. One guy leaves the conversation upset. And he's mad at his boss. And don't they know what I bring to this company? And I, I'm just, I can't believe they don't honor me. And, and how dare they get on to me? Whereas the other guy comes out of that conversation going, man, that was really helpful. Like I, now I know how I can be a better employee and how I can up my game and my sales or whatever. Two people can come into Atmosphere Church and they're listening to the same worship. They're experiencing the same sermon that, that Everybody else is, and one person can leave here and go, on, that was awful. They weren't friendly. I, I mean, you know, what are these donut holes? Like, what is this? And, and man, the music's too loud. The sermon's too long. And, and they leave, right? And the same exact person, or, or the, the, in the same exact service, a person leaves, and they're saying, wow, man, God moved in that place. Man, the donut holes were incredible. Wow, and they're free. That's awesome. Whoa, that worship, man, it moved me to tears. And all that message, man, it, it inspired me so much in my faith. And they leave pumped. The facts were the same, but the feelings were different. Let's say two people watch the same political rally. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go there. <laughs> One person says, oh, wow, wasn't that the best speech ever? Like, wow, I'm so charged and I'm America. You know, and the other person watches it and like, I can't believe that guy. That, that, I can't believe he would say that. That guy's no good for nothing, da, da, da. The facts were the same. It's the same speech. But the filter was different. So your filter that you are running things through is in desperate need of a touch of heaven. Now, we, we just completed 21 days. And, and we heard yesterday, we testified 
uh, of the breakthroughs that people had in the 21 days at our prayer time yesterday. We had three different people come up and testify that God supernaturally healed their body in the 21 days of prayer. One was lung cancer. Another one was a different form of cancer. I mean, it's just incredible. And I'm telling you, the same God that heals us physically is the same God that can heal us mentally. And just because you went through a traumatic event as a child doesn't mean that that traumatic event has to continue to define your life. That we believe in a God that heals. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord that heals. And I believe he can heal our broken filters. And believe me, they are all broken to one degree or another. And how we fix our filter is we change the frame that we're looking through. That's why we call it reframing. Let, let me give you the, the kind of the psychological definition of reframing as it is known a lot of times in therapy and counseling. It's creating a different way of looking at a situation or relationship by changing its meaning. So looking at it from a, a, a different, different view. Okay, so here I have this beautiful picture. I feel like we're micing it up. You know, it's going to talk to us, all right? It is going to kind of talk to us. But let's say we, we just take this picture, okay? And, and let me give you two hypothetical situations, okay? Uh, uh, a person is waking up in the morning, okay? It's Monday morning, all right? So here they are. Oh, I am so tired. Oh, do I really have to go to work today? I hate my job. Oh, did my wife even put gas in the car? Is the Eli on? Oh, man, it's going to be the longest day of my life. I can't believe these people I have to work with, they, they don't do their job. I'm the only one that does anything. Man, my kids, they don't clean their rooms. And man, I've got to get in the car and i got to drive on the 101. I hate the 101. It annoys, every driver on that road annoys me. Or, let's come over here. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, hey, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, I'm so thankful for this day that you've given me. God, I'm so grateful that you've provided me a job that I can wake up and I can earn some money. Lord, you put me around a bunch of heathens that I work with, ungodly people. And I thank you for those ungodly people because I believe I'm going to pray for them and they are going to start following Jesus. Lord, I'm thankful that my kids, you've given me kids that I can help discipline and I can help shape and form. Lord, I'm so grateful that I'm in traffic this morning so that I can have extra time to pray today. And I can pray blessings on the people passing me so quickly. Now, let me ask a question. What, what do you think the outcome of this guy's day is going to be? What do you think the outcome of this guy's day is going to be? Because... What you tend to think about comes out in your life. So, so in order for this to take place, church, listen to me. We have to learn how to reframe our situations. Now, the, I, some of you need to write this down. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. Write that down. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. Because... I'm sure in a crowd like this, watching online, people outside, listen to me. I'm sure there are some of you that life has not worked out exactly how you thought it was going to work out. That's probably a majority of us. We had our expectations. Some of you, you got married to what you thought was going to be like Miss Perfect or Mr. Perfect and life kind of happened and got messy and you've been left brokenhearted and divorced and you, ne you never thought in a million years that you were going to be a divorced person at the place in stage that you're at right now. That stuff happens. That's real life. And you could really get into a mindset of feeling like, man, I don't, 
Like, where's God in this? I'm mad at God, or, or I, can't, I can't believe life has worked out like this. Here's another scenario that a lot of people go, you go to college, you rack up some student debt, you get your degree, you have aspirations like, this career is going to provide for me, you know, it's going to make me, you know, to where I can provide for my family and have a, a, have, you know, a, a wealthy lifestyle. And, and then you get out of college, you drop the resumes, you work the jobs, and, and no promotion happens, no opportunity takes place, and, and now you've been forced to work at a place that you never thought you would ever work at and not doing what you thought you would ever do, and it leaves you in a place where you're just kind of jaded. Like, oh, I thought it was supposed to be like this, but it hasn't really worked out. Well, we all go through moments like this, and, and the Apostle Paul went through a moment like this, and, and we read about this, when he writes this letter to the church in Philippi, we call it the book of Philippians. And believe it or not, the book of Philippians is known as the book of joy, but it's being written as Paul sits in a prison cell, not knowing what his future is going to be like. He doesn't know if he's going to be killed. He doesn't know if he's going to be there forever. He just knows that he wants to spread the gospel. And God had given him a vision and a revelation that he was going to take the gospel to Rome. Now, I'm imagining when he's thinking he's going to bring the gospel to Rome, he did not envision it being through a prison cell. But here he was in a prison cell. And check out how he approached this whole scenario. We can read about it in verses 12 through 14. He says, now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. What's the translation? Guys, this isn't necessarily how I wrote the plan out to be, but guys, check it out. The palace guard, they have to be chained next to me. So as I'm in prison, these guards have to sit next to me for eight hours a shift. Three different guards every day. I get to preach my most famous, most important eight-hour sermon to every guard. And their guards are leaving. And the, the, the whole gospel is advancing because I have an opportunity to share with these palace guards as I'm in chains. And because, he says, of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Like, hey, guys, I'm in prison, but I'm encouraging all the other brothers and sisters out there that they are more bold than ever because of my incarceration. Now, you, you look at this and you're like, wow. Like, that is a crazy perspective to have. Because Paul could have just as easily written the Philippian church and said, Dear church, life really sucks right now. I'm in chains. I thought God was going to do this for me, but apparently God is too busy to help me in my situation. And so therefore, I don't know, just keep praying for me, I guess, and, and pray that I could be delivered someday. That's not what he wrote. See, listen to this. The problem is not the problem. This is a word for somebody here. The problem is not the problem. The problem is how you're looking at your problem. Who's that for this morning? The problem is not the problem. The problem is how you're looking at your problem. It's time to reframe it. James chapter one. Here's a letter. I, honestly, the book of James is one of my favorite books of the Bible because it's just practical Christian. If you wanna know what a real Christian lives like, read the book of James. Check this out, verse two. Dear brothers and sisters, by the way, verse one is like, hey, to everyone that's been scattered because of the persecution, he goes, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Another translation says, consider it pure joy. Consider it opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So James reframes persecution. He's reframing trouble. He's saying, no, trouble is not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it's producing spiritual maturity for your life. And at the end of your life, that is the most important quality that you can possess in your life. So be joyful that life isn't working out the way you thought it was going to work out. That's reframing. 
have a different attitude when you go through hard stuff. Now, reframing can be a helpful way to turn problems and negative thoughts into opportunities and and a chance for, for growth. But we have to install the right filters in our brains in order to produce these results of great joy that we're talking about to reframe it takes some new filters that we need to install into our minds and i'm going to give you four that i believe if you if you work on these four church listen to me you are going to be able to reframe even even the most problematic situation in your life so let's let's check these filters out number one the first filter is i call it the eternity filter or you can call it the eternal filter The eternity filter is about taking your life as focused and as zoomed in as you are about you, and it's the process of zooming out to the bigger picture of what's happening around you. Because here's the part of the big problem that all of us are, are living in. We live in a culture that is focused on me. It's a very, it makes for a very, very small world. You know what the problem is with the small world? When problems happen in your life, it becomes a big deal. Because the smaller your world is, the harder the problems become. But the bigger your world is, the smaller the problems become. And when we're talking about an eternity filter, what we're talking about is zooming out to the big picture of what is God up to through your life, through your issues, for the greater purpose of heaven on earth. Because when you made a decision to follow Jesus, you made a decision to make your life not about your kingdom, but to make your life about God's kingdom. So here's something that the Lord was showing me in 21 Days of Prayer. Jim, how much of your day is about your agenda versus my agenda? God has an agenda for earth. It's about his kingdom. And yeah, you have to live, you have to work, you have to raise a family. And all those things are, yes, you have to do those things, but it's possible to do those things and live for the kingdom of God first before you live for every other thing that you have to do on earth. And the promise is if you seek God's kingdom first, everything else will be added to you. So if you focus the kingdom of you and turn it and flip it to the kingdom of God, what you're doing is you're zooming out. And in the process of zooming out, you have a whole different perspective of life. Because this problem actually may be an opportunity for God to do something incredible that you would have otherwise never seen for your life. I mean, think about a heavenly minded person. When you go into work and you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm not just going to my job. I'm going to work and I'm believing that I'm not here by accident. I'm here on divine mission. That God sent me to this job because of him or her. And I'm praying every day for an opportunity that I can speak the gospel to them through some opportunity that I have at work. So now you're not just going to work. You're going actually on God's mission to your job. Are you tracking the difference here? So it's a kingdom mindset. You're not just like living in your neighborhood, enjoying your family. You have been sent to that neighborhood on purpose for God's kingdom. And so you go into that neighborhood just praying for all your neighbors. You go into that neighborhood thinking like, God, give me an opportunity if one comes up that I can be a a vessel of heaven to love my neighbor in in a practical way. Everything you do on this planet should be kingdom of God focused. And when it is, the trick is to your brain, now all of a sudden your issues don't become big issues. Because your issues are now being compared to God's issues, which are so much bigger. So the bigger your world, the smaller your problems. Are you tracking with me? That's the eternity filter. Everything you're doing has a kingdom of God focus to it. You're zooming out. The second filter, I call it the faith filter. The faith filter. Because here's what we do as humans. We project into the future. We always do. This is probably what's been keeping a lot of you up at night with worry. With, with anxiety. I call it the what if demon. And, and some of you, you, you know the, the what ifs. You're professional what ifers. You know what a what ifer is? What if I lose my job? What if, like, uh, she leaves me? What if he leaves me? Oh, what if I get diagnosed with this disease? Let me Google it right now. Don't do that. 
What, what if, um, you know, this situation doesn't work out? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Now, what I believe God wants us to do is I believe he wants to flip our what if. And instead of being a negative what if, God wants to get involved and, and he wants to infuse himself on your what if so that you can still have a what if, but it has a whole different meaning to it. Let, let me give you a couple examples. Maybe your what if is, what if uh, I step out and I fail? What if that happens? Let's flip that what if. Let's now reframe it and say, what if I step out and see God do something extraordinary and miraculous? You see what happens there? It's, it's not about failure. It's about, wow, this could be an opportunity for something extraordinary or miraculous. What if I don't have what it takes to live a godly life or to be that godly person or to be that leader that I'm supposed to be. Let's flip that. What if God wants to use my weakness to show how powerful he is? What, what if God wants to use my imperfections in a way to show somebody else that God is willing to accept even imperfect people? Let's do another one. What if I, it's never gonna happen for me? What if it's never gonna happen? Maybe you're single. What if, what if I, I'm never going to get married? Here, let's flip that. What if this delay is not a denial, but it's on purpose because God needs to do something supernaturally in us in order to get ready for what he has for us? This is a word for somebody here. I, I want you to know that if you actually receive that gift of a spouse right now, you're not ready for him. You're not ready for her. Why would God bring him or her in your life so that you can make him or her dysfunctional like you are right now? Why, why would God do that? He, he wants to do something in you so that you are ready for that person when they come. Stop looking at a delay as a denial. I believe your delay is actually you getting ready for God's best for your future. So don't, don't look at the waiting room as a bad thing. Look at the waiting room as actually a good thing and say, God, what do you want to do in me while I'm waiting so that I could be ready for that person when they are ready to come into my life? Let's look at another one. What if I lose my job? Let's flip that. What if I've been holding on to a job that is keeping me from getting the job not only that I want, but God wants me in? Because here's what I know about most of us in this room. Paychecks makes for stability. And it's easy to get settled with our paycheck and just get comfortable. And like, I, I don't want to go out. So a lot of us are so comfortable, we would never think of leaving the job that we're at, even though we're not happy at the job that we're at. And so what if, you know, an employer comes and says, hey, we're, you know, due to layoffs, we, we got to lay you off. You're, you're not going to have a job. Instead of going, oh, no, what am I going to do? Now you're saying, hey. I've been praying for God to place me in the right job. So now I'm free to go after that job. You see what happens? You see how we're flipping the what if? Okay, let's go to another one. What if this setback is going to mess me up for my future? We all have setbacks that happen. That's fair. I think a lot of us probably have that what if. Let's flip the what if. What if this setback is actually a setup for my comeback? Come on, somebody. What if this is all a setup to get me moving towards the direction that God has for my future? Here's another one. What if this doesn't work out? What, what if this opportunity never comes? Let's flip that. What if God is closing this door because he has a better door for me to walk through in the future? I've got to tell you a personal testimony about this. A lot of you know our story, but if you haven't been to Atmosphere 101, we're, we're doing our free luncheon next week so you can hear Atmosphere's origin story and, and hear about uh, you know, what God has done in these five years that we've been together as a church. Also, it's a great opportunity for us to get to know you better. So a little plug for a free luncheon next week. But part of our origin story is when Tara and I felt called to start this church here, our church planting network said, go to the schools of your area and ask them if you can have a church there, because most schools are friendly towards having churches. It's an extra form of income, and it's very economical for the church. So Tara and I went to three different schools in the area. 
And we went to three different schools and every principal told us no. And we were bummed. One principal told us no because she did some investigating about what kind of a pastor I was in Las Vegas. And she went to our website and we have a ministry called Hookers for Jesus. And she said, I am so sorry. You seem like a really nice guy, but I cannot have a parent, te- you know, a parent conference you know, with questions about hook. And that is a real ministry that we have in Vegas, by the way. It's a good ministry. And, and so we were told no three times, you guys. And then uh, they told us to go to a movie theater. We went to a movie theater. And then the movie theater was like, ah, it's going to be complicated. It's going to take a long time. And we needed to find a place to meet on Sundays, like, re- like right away. So we're feeling discouraged. We go to our Thursday night Bible study that we're meeting at the hotel. And a lady comes to the Bible study. And she says, hey, uh, have you found a place to meet for Sundays? And I said, no, it's kind of discouraging. She goes, have you thought about the golf course on the other side of the freeway? And I said, I didn't know there was a golf course on the other side of the freeway. She goes, yeah, it's called Los Robles Greens. So we went there the next day, and the event coordinator showed us this beautiful ballroom overlooking the 18th hole, and just majestic. I mean, the schools that we were looking at, they had the chairs, the same folding chairs from the 1960s. And I was like, I guess this will work. And I'm looking at this beautiful ballroom. And already I'm like, this is too nice. This is way too nice. This, this is definitely going to be a no. And so I went into the event coordinator. And was like, yeah, you know, this is beautiful. But you probably don't want to have a church here on Sundays, do you? And she goes, actually, we would love to have a church here. She's like, Sunday morning's the only time that we're not running out this ballroom. So this would be perfect for us if it works out for you guys. And so we ended up signing a contract to start the church at Los Robles Greens Ballroom. Little did we know, 18 months later, a pandemic would break out and all churches meeting indoors would be shut down. However, I don't know how many golf courses in America, please somebody do research for me, how many golf courses in America have a built-in outdoor amphitheater? The golf course that said yes to us had an outdoor amphitheater, so we pivoted during COVID, we met, we only were, I think, down four weeks. We started meeting in person again at the fifth week when the governor and the president said churches can meet. And we started meeting ever since. Our church doubled in size in COVID. And, and we, we just continue to meet and, and grow and be together. So church, listen, lean into this. Don't be discouraged by a no. Don't be discouraged by a closed door. Because what I learned in this process is a no from somebody is getting you closer to God's yes for you and your life. So, so don't be intimidated by closed doors because the closed door is simply getting you to move down the hallway to God's open door for your future. But this is about flipping the what if, and that involves faith. That is the confident expectation that God's best for you is yet to come. That God's Best for you is still in the future waiting for you as you follow him. Here's the third filter. Write this down. And that's the goodness filter. The goodness filter. Look for God's goodness. Let me give you Romans 8, 28. Very famous passage. You'll find this all over Hobby Lobby on posters and mugs. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together. What, church? For good. good. Look at your neighbor. Say, for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Another translation says those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When you love God and you're following Jesus, I want you to know the goodness of God is running after you. It's running after you. And you, you, may, you may not expect that. And maybe you just keep waiting for the shoe to drop because maybe that's just the neural pathways that you've grown up just waiting for the bad to come. I want you to know that when you are following Jesus, when you are loving God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and and all of your might, God's goodness is chasing after you. And it shows up in different forms. I love the picture of the vulture versus the hummingbird. Because to me, this is a, a great metaphor of the reality of you will find what you're looking for. See, a vulture, buzzer, they, they look for dead things and they find dead things. A hummingbird, they look for sweet things and colorful things. Can I give you a word right now? You will find what you're looking for. 
If you're looking for dead things, you're going to find dead things. If you're looking for sweet things, if you're looking for things that are full of life, you will find those things because the goodness of God is running after you. And so if you start looking for the goodness of God, even in negative situations, my friend, you will find it. It's going to happen. And if it's not good yet, he's not done yet. Can I say that one more time? If it's not good yet, he's not done yet. Keep looking for the good. And I love this quote. We're not interpreting the goodness of God through our circumstances. We're interpreting our circumstances through the goodness of God in our life. And the goodness of God is real. And it's chasing you. So number four, probably in the most important filter, and I call it the Thanksgiving filter. The attitude of gratitude. You know, I don't think there's many scriptures where God's will is explicitly given to us other than 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, always giving thanks in everything. Always giving thanks in everything. For this is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus. Always giving thanks in everything. Now, you can come with a posture of just seeing down here all all of the negativity, all the things that are wrong and broken, or you can come up here and you could focus on all the things that are actually good, all the things that are actually working out, all the things that are the the outcomes that shouldn't be. I, I call it thanking God for what hasn't happened to you. When's the last time you just thank God for what hasn't happened to you? We, we focus on the wrong, we focus on what we don't have, but when's the last time we gave some praise to God for what hasn't happened to your life or your family? You know, one of the takeaways of interceding for all of your prayer requests up here during our 21 days of prayer, and I didn't see this coming, but several people came up to me and said, Pastor Jim, I had no idea that Atmosphere families were going through some gnarly situations like this. I want you to know that we took those prayer cards. We're not done praying for you yet. We took them on. We're, we're agreeing that we're going to continue to intercede past the 21 days. Matter of fact, we're calling today our 22nd day of our 21 days of prayer. We're in overtime now, baby. But we got all of these cards, and, and the feedback that I was getting was like, there are, there are some gut-wrenching situations going on. And and I feel bad that I was complaining and even praying for these little things in my life when so many, so many positive things are happening. It put it in perspective. They, they, They were able to reframe their own context by reading some of the gnarly things that other people are going through. Because here's the reality. Somebody else in this world has it a lot harder than you have it. So when's the last time you gave some God some praise? and some thanksgiving for what hasn't happened to your life. When's the last time you gave God some praise and said, God, I'm so grateful that you saved my life. If God didn't do anything else for our life, man, I'm pretty satisfied in that. Because I would be a mess with a capital M if Christ did not come into my life. Because Christ is holding me together when this world is trying to pull me apart. I'm so grateful that my wife loves God. I'm so grateful that my kids love God. I'm so grateful that I live in the promised land. I'm so grateful for all the things that I have, all the things that are right, and I'm going to give God some praise. Why? Because your praise and your thanksgiving reframes your mind. This is why it's God's will. He knows that we have a problem with stinking thinking. He knows that the battlefield is in our mind. And he's saying, I want you to win the war in your mind. I've given you my spirit. Now I'm giving you some tools and some exercises and some practices so you can win the mind war and get on the other side and live the godly life that he's always called you to live. Church, if you're able to, let's stand together. I just, we talked about giving God thanks Let's give him some thanks right now. Lord, we stand in awe of you. God, I know not everyone here outside, online, are followers of you, Jesus, yet. But Lord, I pray for those that maybe still are far from you, God, that that you would speak to them right now. You would reveal yourself to them right now. Show them your love for them, God. Show them your grace for them. 
you came to this world, you died for our sins, and you resurrected from the grave to place heaven inside of us so that we can have new minds and new hearts and new lives. And if you're here today and you have never given your life to God, like so many of us have, I mean, you could feel the presence of God completely overwhelming your body right now. You could feel him. We call that experiencing God around here. That there is residue of 21 days of prayer in this place for you. Matter of fact, we went around this room yesterday. We prayed for chairs. I believe you're sitting in a chair that somebody has interceded for and God is getting a hold of you right now. He loves you. And he has so many amazing plans for your future. If you just give your life to him, surrender yourself to him. Father, you know who needs you. You know who is, is far from you that you are calling close to you. Reveal your goodness to them, God. If you're here today, you want to give your life to God. It's real simple here. We just want to pray for you and you could pray after us. So if you're ready to give your life to God and enter into a relationship with Jesus, just right where you're standing, just pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I give you my life today. Thank you for dying for my sins and resurrecting from the grave so that you could put heaven inside of me. God, I need a new mind. God, I need a new heart. And Lord, I need a new life. And I know I can have it through your spirit living in me. So come and fill my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, or maybe you rededicated yourself to that prayer, text the word follow. This is the best way for you to get a hold of me. Tara and I will be outside. I'd love to meet you in person. But in case we miss each other, please text that number and text the word follow. And we will send you some great resources to help you in your faith. The rest of you, church, we have a lot to praise God for, don't we? Can we give him a shout of praise right now? Can, can you just let God know something that you're excited for him? Come on, church, lift up your voices. Give them some thanks. Give them some thanks, church. Give them some thanks. Let's worship.